Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you and welcome to this special session of the Doha Debates sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. It coincides with a meeting here of the Alliance of Civilizations, a UN initiative set up to combat extremism wherever it appears. And that's our issue for today. But who can define extremism for the rest of the world? Look at the difficulties in defining terrorism. And as we've seen in the current controversy over the Danish cartoons, who's going to listen to any pleas for calm or moderation? Just some of the questions that are going to be asked today by our student audience, coming as they do from many countries, but predominantly from the Arab world. Well, as you can see, we have a distinguished panel bracing itself to respond to their questions. Desmond Tutu, who as Archbishop of Cape Town was one of the chief architects of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission and a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Diana Bhutu, a lawyer by training and a former legal advisor to the Palestine Liberation Organization during peace negotiations with Israel. She also helped to set up an outreach program speaking directly to ordinary Israelis about the effects of occupation. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, a leading and outspoken Muslim scholar. He travels the world giving talks on Islam and is the founder of the Zaytuna Institute, dedicated to the revival of traditional Islamic study methods and the sciences of Islam. And Dr. John Esposito, professor and founding director of the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University. He's also served as president of the Middle East Studies Association of North America and is a prolific author with some 30 titles to his name. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel, and welcome to all of you. What we're going to try and do, first of all, and maybe this is very ambitious, but we're going to try and get the issue of definitions out of the way so that it doesn't dog our discussions for the rest of the afternoon. So could I please ask Nasser Althani to give us the first question. I would like to see an internationally agreed upon definition to words like extremism and terrorism. Does the panel think, think this, uh, this could ever be possible? Desmond Tutu, can we get definitions of extremism and terrorism? We haven't had much luck in doing that so far, have we? Extremism is when I think you do not allow for a different point of view. And when you hold your view as being quite exclusive, when you don't allow for the possibility of difference. My father used to say, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. That's a real problem, defining extremism. I think it's a little, maybe a little bit like obscenity. You know, I know it when I see it. Um, but it's, it's one of those nebulous terms. But without a definition of I extremism, think the how yeah, do you know what you're combating? I think the best definition that I can come up with is, is Caleb Carr's, which is that terrorism is the use, it's, it's the use of violence in order, by, against civilians in order that that population uh, that's being aggressed upon uh, forces their government to the table of negotiation or to some change in their, in their policies. Diana Bhutu, definition of extremism? I think it's very difficult to come up with a definition of extremism because, again, it, it implies that there's a norm, and unfortunately we see that norms are shifting and changing. I think it's, it's important to understand what the cause of it is rather than to, to make a definition of what it is. But it's not an abstract concept. It's propagated by people, isn't it? It is absolutely propagated by pe people, just in the same way that terrorism is propagated by people, but so is war. And unfortunately, we've gotten to a point where terrorism is the new bad word rather than the word war. There was a time when I was growing up when the word war or apartheid or things, those sorts of concepts were much worse than terrorism. And I think now because we don't know exactly who it is that's carrying out these acts or why it is that they're carrying out these acts, or so we, we suppose that we don't know, that that's why it becomes a much more looming term than, than that of war. John Esposito, are we starting with a muddle where definitions are concerned? Yeah, is, I think is, I should is, is that a major setback? I think I this we is can come problem. up with an abstract yeah. definition, yeah. Yeah. but the only way we can get, when we want to get specific, then we have to look at a specific political or religious context. Okay, well, we have a second questioner who wants to get quite specific. Omar Aluba, could we have your question, please? Uh, does the panel consider the Israeli government an extremist in that it kills innocent Muslim women and children in Palestine? Diana Bhutu, do you want to take that? Yes. 
<laughs> that, that was a yes to taking it and a yes to the question. Uh, yes, I do consider that uh, the Israeli government is, is an extremist government in that uh, it has maintained an, an occupation now over the Palestinians for close to 39 years. It has carried out uh, immense acts of aggression against the Palestinians, including the killing of innocent civilians, the demolition of homes, uh, the deportation of Palestinians, the denial of natural resources, and most importantly, the denial of freedom. All of this has been done for political purpose, and the political purpose is to try to rid uh, historic Palestine of the Palestinians and in order to create Eretz Israel or larger Israel. So yes, I do consider it extremist. Do you consider Hamas an extremist movement as well for blowing up civilians on buses? I think that the acts that Hamas is carrying out are, are, would in fact, in my definition of extremists, be labeled extremists. But I think it is important to understand the context in which international law and international relations are, take place, which is there is a powerful and there's a powerless, and it's, it's by and large the powerful who are making the definitions to be used against those who are, who are much more who are powerless. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Uh, certainly in their, in their uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian state, I, I, I would have to absolutely assert that they're an extreme government. Collective guilt is, is, is not recognized by any uh, law tradition on this planet that has any weight. And so destroying people's houses because they happen to be related to somebody that committed a, supposedly committed a crime or committed a crime is an extreme uh, and gross uh, aggression against all sense of international justice. So, so you would want to see the AOC group going to the Israeli government and saying on behalf of the United Nations that this is reprehensible behavior and you should stop it? Absolutely. Rabbi Schneier, would you like to come in on this? We can get a microphone to you, please. There's a very basic premise, and the basic premise is mutual acceptance or in my words, to live and let live. I want you to live as a sovereign, independent state of Palestine, and I want Israel to be a sovereign, independent Israel. Mutual acceptance, it's the only way to go. I tell you, young people, it's in your hand because you control the future. We're the past. You control the future. If you reach out to one another in terms of mutual acceptance, you can build a glorious future. And that's the way to go. And I, I'm convinced that this conflict will come to an end just as any other conflict. Can you that's have mutual acceptance, though, of people who commit atrocities or other extremist acts? Uh, the way to go is really respect for the other, respect for human life, respect for the stranger. We talk a lot about democracy. If you want to have a definition of democracy, how the majority treats the minority, mm -hmm. whether it's politically or religiously speaking, that is a barometer, how the majority treats the minority. Okay, Rabbi, thank you, thank you very much. Diana, can you live with that? with the definition of, mm. of democracy. Yes. I think it's a, a test of a strong democracy is how, the a litmus test is how is it that we do treat the minorities? This is something that uh, I've always been, been uh, advocating and looking towards is how is it that we treat the weakest elements of our own society? Are they treated with respect, with dignity, or are they treated as though they're second class citizens? And uh, unfortunately, in, in the case of, of the Palestinians, they haven't been treated with dignity or with, with respect. Uh, there are Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, who are minorities, who are second class citizens, who are not treated with any dignity, respect, and, and above all, they're uh, not denied, and, and above all, have been denied their freedom. All right, can I just give a reminder that we do want to hear also from you, our student participants, and also from the UN group as well. So please, if you have any feelings, do share them with us. We, ah, lady in the fourth row, we get a microphone to you, please. I just, you're being, you know, trying to define what extremism is and what's terrorism. I think that there is a difference between the political extremism and religious extremism. I think that religious extremism is going beyond the fundamentalism. I mean, fundamentalism is um, adopting each, for example, for Muslims, adopting uh, the Sharia as it is and 
doing it exactly the way God has asked us to do it. And there, for me, religious extremism is going beyond that, is trying to impose it on others to do, um, you know, to be like them. Um, and it's before terrorism. I, th I think uh, fund terrorism is linked with violence. F extremism, if you're an extremism, uh, extremist, you're not necessarily a, f a terrorist. This is why I think personally. And I think that political extremism is like wanting to impose your opinion on the other parties, like uh, in a government or... Okay, she comes to you. Well, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with that in terms of extremism. Um, for a lot of people in the West now, in a, in a society informed by secularism, you know, uh, the fact that I pray and wash five times a day was seen, would be seen as obsessive compulsive disorder to some people, you know, like a, a pathology. Um, so I think people will consider a lot of Muslims uh, religious extremists because they pray by the minimum five times a day. Um, for a Muslim, uh, it's actually, it's, it's interesting, in Islam the definition of extremism includes also lack of religion. So um, people that are not religious are seen as extremists in that they're not, they're not fulfilling a basic human function. So again, it's about definitions and who's defining them. And I think different cultures will define things very differently. And labeling theory, you know, Foucault says ultimately it is the powerful that define things. And right now, uh, Western civilization has an immense amount of sovereignty on the planet. And so in that sense, it has framed the discourse. And all of us are often stuck in this position of reacting to an already framed discourse and, and not allowing our own terms of debate to be allowed into the discourse. So we have to constantly define ourselves. I'm not an extremist. I'm not a terrorist. I'm not this. I'm not that. Uh, as opposed to being able to be in a more positive position which is always taken by the powerful. They're, they're the ones that tell us who they are and they force us to tell them who we're not. But I think the danger of religious extremism can be, even though it's not necessarily violent, to get back to the Archbishop's definition, when it becomes exclusivist, in which it basically says, not only is my faith right, but your faith is absolutely wrong, and not only is my faith right, but my faith position within my faith is right, and so another Muslim who disagrees with me is wrong, then you're moving you're, very, you're in a very dangerous position here because you're bordering on what I would call a theology of hate. That kind of mentality can easily be used by some, and it has been used by people like Osama bin Laden, to legitimate military action at a certain point. You can easily slip over the line once you're into that realm of, of what I would call a theology of hate. And we see that with elements of the Christian right, the Jewish right, and with elements of the Muslim right. I'm avoiding the word fund fundamentalism here, but I okay. think you know what I mean. Right. I want to move on to one of the most controversial issues of all, which is the Danish cartoons. And uh, we have a question from Lenin Diaz, please. How can a Muslim ever explain to a Christian the reason of the uproar over the cartoons? I am a Christian and I understand that the prophet should, should never be drawn. But I don't understand why so many people have to be killed from it. And if so, aren't there any Muslims who think this is extreme? Okay, you say you understand that there shouldn't be a drawing of the Prophet, but why would so many people want to kill because of it? Don't, aren't there any Muslims who think that this is extreme? Yeah. Well, Hamza Yusuf. First of all, I think that the reactions in a lot of places were certainly extreme reactions. I mean, violence, there was, there was nothing would warrant the violence that occurred in Pakistan or Nigeria or other places. Over 40 people have been killed as a result. On the other hand, I think one of the things that the West has, uh, particularly uh, Western Europe, I think it's pr probably less so in, uh, in the United States, um, but it's very, very difficult for people to realize now that religious identity in the Muslim world is far more important than racial identity. And, and we do not tolerate racial uh, denigration in the West. It's, it's, it's considered completely unacceptable and it's condemned. On the other hand, religion is just fair game. And I think what, what we need to do globally is conflate race and religion. That identity, because at, at the core of race is identity and at the core of a true religious experience is identity. I am identified as a believer first and foremost. If you denigrate my religion, you are 
doing something far more egregious to me than attacking my race. And that's where the response is elicited. If okay, you let, me, let me bring in Desmond Tutu here. How do you stop legitimate anger turning to extremism yeah. in, in, the, in the case of the cartoons, yeah. for instance? No, I myself um, would have appealed to um, our Muslim sisters and brothers, um, having been offended as they were, um, and I did, I was among those who did make the appeal for, for, for the demonstrations to have been um, dignified and peaceful. But I think, I think we, particularly Christians, are incredibly arrogant to say to someone, you, you are hurt actually sometimes even suggest that you have no reason to be hurt. I mean, wh how can you be hurt just by a cartoon? And, and I think it's an incredible um, arrogance on anyone's part. Uh, I mean, some people said, well, we are sorry that we offended you, but you had no right to be offended. I say, just try and say that to your wife if you're married and you say, well, I'm sorry, but I mean, what right did you have? You really shouldn't be uh, 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 offended. I, I, I think we ought to be looking to ourselves, because you see, if we had a slightly different power disposition, we wouldn't say that. Diana um, Bhutto, were there Muslims in the Gaza Strip where you live who thought the reaction to the cartoons was extreme? I am a Muslim and I do live in the Gaza Strip and I thought uh, the reaction was extreme but at the same time it was understandable. Gosh, but you're offering understanding for an extremist reaction. I understand why it happened, I don't agree with it. I think that uh, the reason that the protests were happening, there were, it's complex, I mean, some of the, some of the, there's a question of freedom of expression within the Arab world itself, uh, whether these were really spontaneous, uh, spontaneous uh, outbursts of, of anger and so on and so forth, but I think that for those who were actually protesting, it was by and large because there, there was no other means of expressing their discontent content to the Danish government and other governments. John Esposito. I, I think that there are a couple of things that come into play here. I think one, clearly uh, there was a strong religious motivation to that reaction. Um, as somebody who studied with Muslim teachers and mostly Muslim students, although at a secular university in America 35 years ago, that was driven home to me. But I think the reality of it is was that the cartoon and the reaction to the cartoon uh, the, the roots of that rage and anger run much deeper and it has to do with the political and social situation of many Muslims in many parts of the world and particularly uh, uh, among other things uh, setting aside the, the question of the Arab-Israeli conflict looking at the fact that for many Muslims the war against global terrorism increasingly looks like a war against Islam in the Muslim world the sense of dependency, humiliation, etc. and then to see your most sacred symbol ridiculed. It'd be different if you had the cartoons dealing with Zakawi or Osama bin Laden. But the idea that one would associate, as it were, this most sacred symbol of Islam, the Prophet, with acts of, of, of terrorism is in effect saying this is deliberately, this is an, a, delib a deliberate attempt to provoke. Can we hear from some other voices around the room? You say, next, next to you. Do you think Muslims overreacted no, but or took, it, took the cartoons too personally? I took it personally, but the problem is that how they reacted, because uh, things could have, like in Qatar, for example, some places chose to boycott the, uh, the Danish uh, products, and this is a good way. But uh, in Lebanon, they burned the, uh, the Danish embassy, and they burned also a church. And this is just wrong, because they could have dealt with it in another way. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, what do you think of it? Well, I, I personally, I felt that the boycott was basically collective guilt. It's, it's the same thing that we're troubled about in other places. And so I personally was very opposed to the reaction against the Danish embassy. The Syrian ambassador to, to uh, for the, uh, the Danish ambassador to, to Syria, uh, who just left uh, a few months ago is, is a Muslim Dane who rode his bike from Riyadh to Mecca to do Umrah. 
uh, a very wonderful man, Ambassador Olson, and he was, he was just outraged by, by that response. And, and it actually harmed a lot of Arab business people who have trade and commerce. So I, ju I just feel that it was completely unfair okay. uh, to blame Let, the Danes. I wanted to see. Uh, may I say what I wanted to say? Please. Yes, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Who am I to deny you? Uh, freedom of speech. <laughs> In fact, you want very little to provoke reaction when you are carrying the burden of an anguish. When you have a resentment at being humiliated and treated as if you were nothing. We, we are constantly going to find things that happen, outbursts and you see. But I mean, why? And, and many would say, yes, no, we didn't think the reaction should have been so and so. But that reaction is not related to the immediate cause. It is I am hurting, please, I am hurting. I have been treated as if I were nothing. Can you take note of me? All right, thank you very much. Let's go on to another question. This was from Aisha Waka, please. Could we have your question? When the Danish government eventually met with Muslims in Denmark, they chose only to meet with the moderate Muslims. Isn't some of the extremism in Islam a result of the frustration born out of the West's desire to have dialogue only on its own terms? John Esposito, is that a fair comment? Yeah, I think that part of the problem that we have historically, um, I've seen it over the years, is that you will, we hold um, conferences, whether it's governments, whether it's non-government organizations and universities, and uh, often we talk about people who are not in the room, and we don't invite them in the room. The alternative voices. Uh, to give you the most uh, uh, bizarre example, post 9-11, uh, from my point of view, is a situation uh, in the United States at times, when you will get a phone call and somebody will say, uh, we want to meet with a group of moderate Muslims, can you give me a list? As if it's a short list. Or we have, we have a group here that wants to go up to Congress and they're Muslim leaders, can you look it over and let us know whether or not they're moderate Muslims. Uh, the reality of it is that what we have to learn when we deal with situations uh, is that we have to talk to a broad spectrum of the population. And so if there's a dialogue, dialogue implies that it's going on between two people. And if it's about a hot issue, you need to be talking about the people who are at the heart of the hot issue and not Diana, simply talking Diana about... Diana Brutto, you find the West picking and choosing its interlocutors and only the moderate ones? Absolutely, and in fact that was the point I was going to make is that oftentimes, particularly for those who live in the Middle East, that our, our, our interlocutors are chosen for us rather than the ability to choose the interlocutor and hence the case right now with the Palestinian elections where the Palestinians have overwhelmingly chosen Hamas and yet there is nobody who's willing to talk to Hamas despite that this is now the voice of the, of the Palestinians in terms of the Palestinian authority. Authority. And so there's means to go around that. Let's talk to this person. He's much more favorable. He sees, we'll see eye to eye with him. But what they're doing, in effect, is they're actually ignoring a large census or a large segment of the population who, for whom Hamas does. You uh, think they're ignoring them or just talking to them quietly behind the scenes? All the evidence suggests they are talking to them quietly behind the scenes. They probably are talking to them quietly behind the scenes uh, for, for reasons that I think are, are not necessarily in order to get, engage in dialogue but to calm uh, violence down more than anything else. But I think in so doing, what they're doing is alienating a large segment of, of the population, whether it's in Palestine or other parts of the Middle East or Arab world. All right, there's a lady two rows from the back who's had her hand up for a while. Muslims who responded so chaotically to the cartoon didn't probably have a clear idea of Islam, of Islam as religion itself, of Islam being a spiritual um, of, of uh, religion. So I, I personally see it, it as a failure of the uh, Muslim leaders. I think that if, if, um, if the Ummah was led more um, um, toward, towards a, a, for a, a, a specific point by, by the actual Muslim leaders, um, the response would not have been that chaotic. Because Islam, Islam itself does not teach um, extremism. Is the problem a lack of central authority in Islam? Um, I, 
authority, well, author Islam, Islam gives authority to pe people like um, mullahs and so. If only those people did, um, um, took, took part and um, they, did, they, they led the population towards the right direction, um, I, I think they wouldn't have been such a chaotic response. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, the, well, the lack of central authority. It's, it's a Islam. major problem because Islam, in, in, in its classical formation, recognizes the idea of a caliphate. Uh, in the absence of a caliphate, it, it's just open game in terms of religious authority. So it's, it's a real problem and, and, and we're suffering from it. Great teaching institutions that produce really high caliber scholars uh, no longer exist. And so people in the Arab world know you get good grades, you go to medical school, uh, great grades, medical school, good grades, uh, engineering, uh, reasonable agriculture, political <laughs> science, really bad grades, you go to Islamic uh, Sharia College, and and so we're, we've got a lot of third rate, unfortunately, and with respect, you know, to to people and their uh, their abilities. But we have a lot of of people that are just not up for the level of challenge uh, in the religious uh, sphere. All right, we'll move to a, a, another question, please, from Muna Babikir. Do you think extremists, like all extremists, are wrong, or are they right at some point? Diana Bhutto, you seem to suggest that they could be right at some point. At least you were offering understanding to some of them a little earlier. I, th I think I go back to my initial point, which is I think it's very difficult to define what extremism is because it implies that there is a norm, which, and that norm is normally set by the more powerful party. That said, I think that it's, it's understandable to... to uh, it's, it's, it's understandable why certain acts take place that people would define as extremism. And it's, it's understandable, particularly in the place where I live and where I see such acts taking place, I do understand why it's happening. It's happening in a political context. It's not happening in the absence of a political context. It's happening because people have been denied their freedom for such a long period of time. Okay, Desmond Tutu, you were labeled as an extremist in your time, weren't you? Plenty of times. <laughs> Yes, I think, I mean, again, uh, the, the Professor Spichotto was, was right in uh, saying, I mean, context are important. But the question was, are they right? Yes, I think, I mean, that there, there is a, a measure of truth and often a great measure of truth. It, it, it is, it is, that it is, it tends to say it is the only truth um, and everything else is, is wrong. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I would just hope that one day we can become the kind of people who say, yeah, I don't actually agree with you but I, I will defend your right to your point of view, and, and I won't want to, to clobber you uh, for, for, for holding your point of view. If we could, what an incredible world, how, how incredibly rich this world would be if we got to accepting that none of us can ever be totally self-sufficient. The way God created us was deliberately to create us as those who need one another. What were created for interdependence. You have gifts that I don't have. And I have gifts you don't have. And you could almost see God rubbing God's hands and saying, voila, now you know that you need the other in order to be fully complete. All right, there's a gentleman up there. Could you stand up, please, and we'll get a microphone to you, and then we'll come to the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, I, have, I have a question, actually, to the elite lines group. Re related, and also, related to yeah, this. Yeah, of course, it's related. I would like to see UN treating the problems. For example, when you're treating the disease and illness, we're not, we're not, you don't want to ameliorate the problems. You don't want to remove the problems or lessen them. You want to treat it. You want to eradicate it. For all this time we're talking about extreme actions, we're talking about Muslims going extreme and, and killing, I mean, of course it's wrong. We're talking about Palestinians blowing up innocent civilians. We're talking about, uh, why don't we talk about why is that happening? Why don't we talk mm. about, for example, what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina from 1992 to 1995? Uh, why did that happen? I would like to state, um, this can be argued, but as was suggested on the floor, 
the acts of extremism come from two directions, either from those who are extremely anguished and are trying to achieve their freedom and rights, or from those who have huge amounts of greed. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would truly and honestly like to see the world treating the problems at their roots, not actions that come as a result of them. And how would you suggest the UN group therefore goes about its work? I'm currently studying, so I'm, I'm, I'm acquiring intelligence. I'm, I'm learning how to treat these problems. I have my own opinion. Well, on they're it. here. You have a chance to give them some advice. I, I would like the world to realize why Muslims are angry. I mean, th this is, it, as it was suggested, it's been bottling up. There's a lot of oppressions of Muslims all around the world. And not only Muslims, I mean, Christians also, as we said, minorities. How we treat minorities is a degree of our democracy, and I'm sorry to say, but I've experienced it for, firsthand. I'm a Bosnian, and I, I've seen, even though I was a majority, I have seen how I was treated. John Esposito. Yeah, I think that one has to, uh, I take very seriously what you said, and I, th I think there has to be a kind of two-pronged approach. I think one, you do have to look at what the root causes are, and, and, and often people don't want, the way people get around dealing with <laughs> serious situations of injustice is to just say they're a bunch of extremists, as if therefore they're just irrational. So you have to deal with root causes, and I, and I think that uh, members of the alliance certainly are concerned about this, as many in the room are. But I also think that something that, to follow up on what Arch Archbishop Tutu said and also what the rabbi said earlier, there's the positive constructive side. If we're going to talk about creating a better world, and it's, your, and it's for your generation to do it. On the one hand, when you see injustice, you have to look at what are the political, socioeconomic root causes. At the same time, we have to begin to promote a world that takes globalization and pluralism very seriously. A world in which we really do be able to say we can agree to disagree. A world which can say you can hold your beliefs as firmly as you want, religious, political, and I can hold mine, but I can also understand where you're coming from, I can make that effort, and I can respect your right to believe that way. And, and so it's got to be a two-pronged uh, approach, it seems to me. In well, a sense, uh, you know, an immediate as well as a long term. All right, let's go on to a question from Aisha Butt, please. Um, do you not feel that a whole generation has been lost to extremism because extremism is seen as a logical response to the injustices suffered by Muslims at the hands of the West? And do you also not feel that until those injustices are addressed, extremism will remain a part of the Islamic identity? Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. One of the things that's really overwhelming for the Muslims and why you're getting really radical responses is the, the culture of the West, which was n not really, it never colonized uh, the Muslim world in any, in any real way. There was a, a military uh, presence, but the Muslims still had their culture intact. Now you have a real uh, onslaught of culture, and there's an incredible amount of cognitive dissonance uh, in, amongst Muslims, and a lot of the more religiously informed, they just don't know how to deal with, how do you deal with MTV? You know, how, I mean, how, how, how does a, a, a devout Muslim deal with MTV and the fact that his children are watching this? I just, I don't, you know, there's, there's a beautiful Arab poem, you know, inna la fi zamanin, I'll just, inna la fi zamanin, li farti shududihi man la yujannu bihi laysa bi'aqili. We're living in an age of such extremes that the one who's not driven mad by it is not sane. <laughs> Let me go back to the question and ask you whether you feel that the generation has been lost. Could you stand up, please? Um, well, partly. I mean, like he said, through MTV and everything, everyone is influenced by these things, especially through Western clothes and stuff like that. So, yeah, partly it has been lost. I mean, we try to keep it, we try to keep our Islamic culture in there, but with influences like from TV and from Western culture, things keep, I mean, like, they keep on coming in, and you can't stop that. You can't stop the changes. So. This gentleman four rows back. Can we get a microphone? Could you stand up, please, sir? I don't think the youth today have meaningful uh, avenues and, and forums where they can carry out meaningful debate and discussions, much like this forum here. I think the, the, the main point that we should bring out is that we should foster an environment that, that encourages this debate, and not necessarily saying that I agree that you're right, what I think what Mr. Tutu was saying, but I, I think that you're wrong, but in a respectful, in a respectful way, okay. and that we can... <laughs> For, 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 exa for example, I think you're an idiot, but 
respectful way. <laughs> for, for example, for example, uh, let's say to a Muslim, we, we can never accept that the Trinity is a truth. But somebody may hold that uh, to be a truth. But at the end of the day, we should be able to walk away as human beings, as, as, uh, as brothers in humanity. <laughs> so I don't think that eliminating this form of extremism is necessarily um, accepting that every truth is correct. It's just fostering an environment that allows a debate. Desmond Tutu, you want to come in here? It's fantastic that you care. And I, I, I would say yes, I mean, you have, you, you have many things that are against you. But one of the most wonderful things about young people, yourselves, is that you are such idealistic creatures. And why you care, why you are outraged, is, is your belief that this world can be, in fact, a better place. And I'm glad that there are young people like you. I, I, I'm appalled, I mean, that you should be talking of lost generations and things of that kind. You ain't lost generations. You are fantastic people. And, and, and I'm glad you're around. And I wish I was, I was maybe like, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you're going to hold that thought. No, no, I, 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 I really want to say this to you. You are God's most outstanding collaborators for turning this world into a better place. Question there from the panel. I, when I talk to uh, British or American youth, what I say is that uh, perhaps my generation can't sort this out. And you are young enough to have a new idea to change the world by thinking critically and participating. We, sh we should give you more avenues to speak and to think and make your views heard. We, we're very, we've been very concerned about this on the Alliance. And, uh, and it's been wonderful to listen to you today with views uh, that you can share with us. And, but go on thinking. Don't ever stop questioning. All right. I want to go to a question which actually follows up exactly on that thought. And this is from Amber Tariq. What do you believe that Muslim women can do within their communities to fight the rise of extremism within this region? What can Muslim women do in their homes and in their communities to fight the rise of extremism? Diana Bhutu. Thank you. <laughs> women can do a number of things. Uh, one is, is to be engaged in their communities and in their societies. And whether engaged that, in what way? Engaged in, in, all, in all different types of levels. Some on a, examples. For example, on a political level, women, women's involvement uh, does not have to end at a, certain, at a certain area and begin in a certain area. For example, women can get involved in the political spectrum. I've been involved in the political arena. You can get, women can, can get involved in social arenas, uh, community service, charitable organizations. They can get involved even just on, a, on the level of home maintenance, of maintaining and raising children who are going to then become also productive members of society. The, the real challenge is, is that space going to be provided to women or are they constantly going to have to fight for that arena to be able to have their voices heard? Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, advice to Muslim women well, in their home. Well, I think, I think it's, it's important just th th there, there needs to be deeply nurturing environments, but there also there needs to be from, from the husbands uh, and the brothers, there also needs to be uh, that, that nurturing. The, the Quran says when, the, when the, the, the daughters ask why she was buried alive, there's more ways to bury a, a woman alive than, than physically. You know, a lot of our women, I think, are, are, are buried alive in, in the Islamic community, um, and, and that needs to change. Could we, could we hear from some young Muslim women, perhaps, involved in their communities in fighting extremism? Anybody who particularly feels they should get involved in fighting extremism? Can we hear from anybody who might have a view on that? Yes, you. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to get involved, but the thing is, I don't know how I could get involved without going around offending someone or like within the rights of my freedom like with my dad it was very nice of him to allow me to come here today but um, I don't know how much further I could actually go without like offending anyone or being allowed to. 
This is a common problem, isn't it? I, I, think, I think it is. I, we, you know, our, our societies, are, our Western society is very, very different uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. And the, the Arabic word for woman is hurma, which, which is, is, is like a sanctuary. It's something seen by the Arab as, as something you protect. And the worst thing you can call an Arab male is a dayuth which is somebody who ha has no concern for women. So, the, you know, it, traditionally the Arab culture is a very chivalrous culture. Unfortunately, chivalry can become something else. It can, it, it, it can transform into, into quite negative, uh, uh, you know, this, this mad jealousy and this kind of insane desire for this authoritarian despotic model, which is very common. And I think that we need to undermine that model because I think that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was not a despotic person. His, his women spoke back to him and he did not rebuke them for it. Um, Aisha is a startling uh, and stunning woman. If you study her life, she, she, his, his wife was a very vibrant woman. And I, and I think if we study the early women of Islam, you will really find that they, they were dynamic women. They were out there, you know, leading armies. They were fighting in battles. They, they were establishing charity organizations. Over 40% of the Ottoman endowments are endowed by women. I mean, we have this as records. So, and Sheikha Moza, I think, is very much in that tradition, and, and, and we honor her for that. But I, we... we Are, are, there, are there any other women who would like to get more involved in combating extremism, extremism but don't feel they can, they feel restricted? Is, can we get a microphone to you, uh, lady who's three rows down? Um, with me, it's probably cultural um, restrictions. I personally come from Pakistan, where you have um, uh, people, come, people, people religious, but on the other hand, when religion allows you certain thing, the culture comes back and says, no, you're not allowed to do that. So uh, for me, culture has a bigger influence. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, now currently involved in the Reach Out to Asia team, and I might be going to Pakistan. My parents allow me, but then on the other hand, my other family members will be doing it as a bad thing, me uh, as a female going with males alone to uh, for, uh, in another country. So it's more of a cultural thing as well when it comes over religious beliefs. If you look at some Muslim women today, is that there are, there, are, there are two general ways you can be empowered. One is to wait for men to empower you. The other is to realize that part of the way in which you become empowered is to empower yourself. And, and that's one of the, I think, the, Easy the for issues you to that, say. that you struggle well, with. It? Well, it's, it's interesting. In There's a really important point. Uh, the Quranic language was almost entirely male until one of the women actually complained about it. She went to the Prophet and she said, why are these verses all talking about men? All the verses that came after that complaint were, were, were men and women, believing men, believing women, dhakar uh, untha. And so I think it does take, I, I mean, I agree that it's going to take some effort, but it also needs to be done with cultural sensitivity. So it, it's, it's not, uh, you, you know, it doesn't create fitna or, or, or social disorder. And there are models across the Muslim world. So, I mean, if you look around, there are Muslim women there who demonstrate this form of empowerment, whether it's uh, Quran study, uh, whether it's prayer groups, whether it's NGOs, whether it's education. You know, you can see that. You can see it here if you look at the, the role of, of, of women, the emerging role of women in this society. All right, we come to a question which uh, puts the UN on the spot here. The question is from Grant Gunther. Could we have your question, please? Since extremist groups operating in the world today pay so little heed to what world leaders say about extremism, on what basis does the UN think they will listen to this new forum? Would you like to have no, a no, 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 final no. word to say I, on this subject? I think the world is aware it is in a mess. And because it is in a mess, they are going to have to listen. See, this group is not monochrome. This group does not come from one country. This group does not represent just one philosophy, religion, and it's people with very diverse views. And you would have thought that they would not even make it to first base in terms of being able to understand one another. So, so one is able to say, you know, an enemy is a friend waiting to be made. And that's not just a facile 
for a slogan. It is for real. And if the world doesn't know that it is in a mess, wow. Okay, let me ask the question if he's encouraged by your answer. Are you encouraged by that answer? I'm encouraged by that, but I'm also, but I'm also encouraged by um, some other ideas in the room of like, you know, trying to foster, you know, talking between um, other peoples in the region to try and understand one another because I think that's one of the main problems is that people don't understand and don't accept and what they don't accept they fear. Um, and so I think combating that will help us um, resolve a whole bunch of the, the problems that we're facing today. All right, we're running out of time and my panel is telling me that they have to get away. Just remains for me to thank all of our distinguished panelists for coming today. Thank you very much to the audience for coming. And hope to see you again. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>